The drama continues to build. I love drama as long as it's not in my own life. I like it externally. We bring in Shannon Spake now. Uh, are you big on drama outside of the household, uh, but inside of the household, try to keep it to a limit? No, I, 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 I am not. I, I can't stand drama. I don't watch any of those like Real Housewives. Those, oh, you're uh, so lying. You, you watched Meghan Where? Markle and you got all into the British royal family <laughs> and everything else. Like, don't pretend I, that you I don't watch- like drama. <laughs> I watched the interview. And you listen to Howard Stern (laughs) and you listen to this show. So you might say that you don't watch The Real Housewives. By the way, according to my wife, Beverly Hills and Orange County are the two best. But that's uh, she watches a lot of that. And then uh, have you ever watched 90 Day Fiance, by the way? No. Mm -mm. Okay. No. It's like the most popular show on television. No, like I like I've told you before, I watch like the things I do watch. Like right now, I'm watching The Crown. That's like the big thing. That and oh, I guess my that wife loved The Crown. Dramatic. That's drama. Yeah, who's your but favorite watch, character on The Crown? I can tell you who my least favorite character is for sure. Prince Charles, Charles like one hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, my favorite character on The Crown, Prince that's Lady Die. Are you there um, yet? We are on Lady Die. We're on her season. I uh, yeah, I kind of like the sister. Is it Princess Margaret? She, yes, she's cool, right? She seems like she'd be fun to hang out with and and just kind of like gallivant the country with. So I, I did like her, even like the first two series. I liked her. She had a really dynamic character. Uh, but we are in Princess Diana's season right now, and it's getting to the point where like he's he's smoking her out, right? He's he's not returning her calls. He's not doing any of these things, and he has everybody kind of watching her to make sure that she's not doing anything wrong. So we're on that. We're sort of in that. Would you right want? Now. Does it make you want to go to England? Um. I, you know, I think I'd like to see Windsor, and and I'll tell you, this past weekend, I watched Prince Philip's funeral. Yes. Uh, I watched it with my kids, and my one son, he's like, Mommy, this is so sad, and, and I tried to explain to him, yes, it's very sad, but he was 99 years old, he had a great life, and this moment that we're watching right now is something historic, and I thought it was so so spectacular because of the fact that there was very little people there. And like you felt like you were part of this small, intimate thing, and you could really see inside the church. You could see, I mean, we've seen inside that church how many times with weddings, but you could really identify certain things because there was no, there were no people in there. And, and just the, the, the vividness of like the, the lawn in contrast with the, with the, with the, uh, the sky and all of the, the scenes, everything was just so spectacular. And we sat and watched the entire thing. The four choirists that were just singing in it, like in an enclave, and it was just, everything about it. I don't know if you watched it, but I found it to be really spectacular. Yeah, I I watch a lot of that stuff because I'm sort of fascinated by the pomp and the circumstance and the pageantry Mm -hmm. of the royal family and the ceremonial nature of all of those proceedings. And Mm -hmm. I will certainly watch, as the queen, I believe, uh, is 95 years old now. So at some point, let's be honest, Prince Charles is going to be coronated at the age of you know 74 or 75 years old. It's not like he's going to be a young king taking over. Uh, but that will be a uh, an event that I certainly will watch. And I watched uh, I watched the Meghan Markle wedding mm-hmm. with Prince Harry and certainly, what has it been, oh, like yeah. seven or eight years ago now? Nine years, ten years ago, whatever it's been. I watched mm-hmm. when Prince William, William got married to, uh, to Kate Middleton. So uh, yeah, it feels like it was like early. forever ago. I woke up really early to watch that. Now, my question for you is, is do you think they'll go straight to Charles? Or do you think they'll skip over Charles and go uh, to I William think they certainly will go to it. I think they certainly will go oh, to yeah. Charles, but I think yeah. the challenge will be William will be, I believe, wildly popular all over mm-hmm. England and around the Commonwealth. I think Charles mm-hmm. is going to be, as you mentioned, not particularly beloved. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm curious how long he will want to, because you could decide to step aside from public life uh-huh. and and pass the the crown on to someone else. But he's waited so long for the ability to be king. I can't imagine that he's going to do it for a really short period of time. I mean, we don't know how long he'll live. Uh, but I would think that uh, that William will ultimately have a decent length reign, but that his dad will probably be uh, probably be king for ten or fifteen years. Would be my expectation before he eventually takes over. 
Yeah, I do think it's fascinating that there's a royal family, you know, and you're you're born into this bloodline and you have all of these things. Like I was looking at some of the jewelry that Prince Philip had purchased. And I watched all I was looking. I mean, I got caught in the the wormhole of Twitter yeah. on that day and uh and I was looking at some of the jewelry that he had purchased uh Queen Elizabeth over the years and I'm like, "Where did he get the money to buy that?" You know, like does that come from like the citizens? Like what well, I mean, is it I mean, you know, it's it's just fascinating uh to me. But but I um as far as the drama, I, I think maybe your show and Howard Stern show, maybe that's the most drama I have in my life. Cause most times, like I said, I'm American pickers. Uh, I, I watch the Kardashians just for hair and makeup tips <laughs> Yes, and, and, and I like their wigs. Um, but that's about it. The, the yelling and the screaming and, and all of this sort of, I, I can't, even my kids, I know you, I've heard you say before, like your kids watch other people play Roblox. Like oh, I yeah. walk into the house when those people are screaming at the top of their lungs on those headsets and moving through sort of the Roblox world. And I'm like, you have got to turn this off. I can't, I can't right now. So it, uh, I, it's, I try to it's limit interesting. Um, my argument has been, and I, I, I know my kids are reflective of so many other kids out there. They watch YouTube and that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm watching sporting events, my, my kids will put on the Braves game. For example, they like to watch the Atlanta Braves. Almost the only thing they ever put on television is an actual sporting event. I don't know that I've ever walked through the house and seen them watching regular television, which Mm -hmm. for our generation, uh, people around our age, Shannon, our parents are always like, turn the television off. You know, there's always like a television on in the house. You're watching something and they basically are done with television. In fact, sports is the only real reason. Now, maybe as they get older, the news stories will become uh, maybe news and sports. They'll be more attracted to the news side of things as well. But otherwise, there's almost no purpose for for live television, and and they love video games more than they even like YouTube, which is pretty wild. Yeah, growing up in Fort Lauderdale, you know, it'd be like 95 degrees, you know, most of the year, and and I remember just growing up and like laying on, I guess, the floor because you had to lay on the floor in order to change the channel because we didn't have remote yeah, oh, controls, yeah. like you had yeah, the one that was yeah. like attached. So you had to lay on the floor next to the TV, but it was like Silver Spoons, Punky Brewster, oh, like, yeah. I mean, all these shows that you would kind of go through. What was your favorite uh, show uh, when you were when you were a kid watching the 1980s shows? That's really hard. I, I, I loved Punky Brewster. I love, like I just mentioned, Silver Spoons. I mean, my whole room, you remember the, like the Teen Bop and the Tiger Beat? Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. yeah. With I, all the posters? Oh, my whole room. My whole room was just like plastered with that stuff. And it's incredible to think that kids don't do that nowadays because they have Instagram and they can see their, you know, they can see whomever, you know, whether it be, I don't know, just who's who's the cool kid nowadays. I don't even know who the cool over. kid is. I mean, it used to be Bieber, right? Um, was was yeah. somebody that everybody was in love with, I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, used to get those, block, you know, yeah, used crazy. to get those, uh, those pullouts like they had. I mean, it was like centerfolds, <laughs> yeah. except they were fully clothed, uh, obviously. And you could like put them on, uh, put them on your wall. And I don't even think, do those brands even still exist that were so popular with like, you know, what was it like probably eight to 14 year olds that were like kind of obsessed with that stuff? Oh, uh, spent so much money. And I think maybe Rob Lowe was like partially clothed most of the time. I think they did have him with his shirt off a lot. Uh, but that's they, they, as they should, because Rob yeah. Lowe back in the 80s and 90s was. Rob Lowe incredible is still incredibly movie. good looking. I, uh, I, uh, he Remember Rob Lowe people. showed up. Was it the Super Bowl like four or five years ago where he had the hat, the NFL hat? Do you remember that? And people were like, oh, it's – do you – Dub, will you look up and see when that was? Rob Lowe, like, they were advertising, you know, some new television show that Rob Lowe was going to be in, and they cut to him in the crowd, and he was he was only wearing – like, he, he wasn't wearing gear for either team. He had an NFL hat on. And everybody oh was God. like, where do you even get an NFL, <laughs> an NFL hat? <laughs> like, you're just such a huge fan of the NFL that you're just rocking the logo on your, on your baseball cap at the Super Bowl game. Uh, and wow. everybody was like, you know, that he was a narc. He looked like the guy in, uh, you know, guy going to school that's pretending he's one of the kids, like just a little bit off. Um, and uh, and that was just, you know, that I, I double find out. I, I know that that was it might have been five years ago or so, but it was at the Super Bowl. They cut to him in the crowd. Uh, still incredibly good looking Rob Lowe, but oh wearing gosh, just yeah. a straight NFL hat. That's funny. I, I'm not looking at Rob Lowe's hat when I see Rob Lowe. Yeah, he's, yes. he's one of those human beings who's like superhuman, uh, never ages. But yeah, the Packers, Tiger was sorry. All over. Yeah, sorry. I'll get Packers. you back to Tiger, Tiger Beat. Dub, when was it? This was, oh, yeah. <laughs> this was more recently than that. It was in the 2020 NFC title game where the 49ers absolutely destroyed the Packers. <laughs> but he was in the crowd in the NF, NFL hat. Yeah, I right about black, like a black it was basically NFL the referee hat. hat. Yeah. 
he was in there. Yeah. So you uh, back. Pictures. There you go. You could post some stuff for my walls. There you go. Yeah, there I'll you go. Uh, your husband will be really excited. You can put it on the ceiling. Yeah. Um, and uh, you guys can look gaze, have a gaze upon on it. my ceiling. Oh, my God. That's so funny you said that. I had a six-foot poster first of Rick Springfield on my ceiling, right? And then it got moved over to Joey McIntyre. Like, they sold these huge posters. And for some reason, I don't know why my parents thought it was okay for, like, a 10 year old to have a poster of Rick Springfield, who was at least like what 12 years older than me at the time, on my ceiling. So I can like look up and see him while I'm in bed. Like, I don't, I don't get the this is, thought process there. This is the, I think, <laughs> this, the era, like you could almost call it the Spencer's gift era. Do you remember Spencer's where you could go <laughs> yes. to the back of Spencer's and they had like all the different uh, posters? Because posters were big oh, yeah. back then. I don't think any kids hardly have posters now. Like, my kids really don't. But you'd had the mm-hmm. posters, and if you were like really hardcore, you'd get them laminated so they didn't like get ripped <laughs> off your, uh, uh, yeah. get ripped off your wall. But you could stand there at the back of Spencer's Gifts, and they had like all the athletes, they had all the musicians, they had all the um, like. I mean, that was such such a big deal to be at the mall when you're like in fifth or sixth grade. You go into Spencer's Gifts, you go to the back, and that was like a, a routine part of the mall trip. You would sit and look at all the different posters. They had them on like that. Uh, that do they still have Spencer's it's gifts like posters at the back? Like I haven't. Yeah, they had like a rack, and you could just pop uh-huh. them through. You know, like spin them one at a time, and like see all the yep. new amazing posters. I I actually I think Spencer's gifts still exist, but I I haven't yep. been in that place probably in twenty five years. Um, and and I would like to go back now. I wonder if they still have posters in the back of that place. Well, and it's super edgy and sort of yes. like a risque, right? Because right. there's a lot of like you know like sexual sort of stuff in there, like That's... like innuendo. My kids actually went to a Spencer's with my sister when they were shopping for Christmas presents, like I think two years ago or something. And my, my son was like, mommy, we went to Spencer's. And I was like, oh, really? Tell me what you saw. And they were like, it was it was stuff that they have not been exposed to for yeah, sure. Right. But I remember you would walk in and you'd kind of be like, am I allowed in here? And the, the person would be at the front kind of like making sure that you're old enough to, to walk into Spencer's because it was, it was it was edgy and it was a little bit like risque. And uh, and also in in Spencer's back then you didn't have access to the internet and Mm-mm. so like the the range of like kids today are exposed for both good and bad to like way more information on ba- yeah. basically every subject than we ever were as kids um, and you know just the, kind of the stuff that they end up watching on YouTube will sometimes uh, surprise me especially my thirteen year old who is like kind of a I mean you know. It's, say he's studying history or whatever, he can type something in, and uh, and the greatest historian who knows something about the War of 1812 has got like a six-minute video that he's done, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot different for us back the in the day. We'd like, have to like go to like the, the library and look through like the Dewey Decimal System and find the oh, book. Oh, yes. And, and the Dewey, the the Dewey Decimal System, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what I they did with like, all those card catalogs, right? Like, I, did they just burn them all? Like, the, the library doesn't have the card catalog anymore. Like, what did they do with all... And this was true, Shannon, by the way, for... Uh, I was... When I started law school, we were right on the edge of the internet taking over everything in the legal profession, right? Because... Just a few years before me, you had to go into a law library and pull books off the shelf to yeah. look up cases. And mm-hmm. I was the, we entered in the class of 2001, so any lawyers out there or people considering law school, now all legal research is online, right? They have yeah. uh, LexisNexis and Westlaw. And they will. They, they basically are like trying to get you to turn into drug addicts because uh, the legal equivalent of one. Because they get you hooked on being able. They give you free printing. They give you free research when you're a law student. With the idea being that once you get to uh, to being a practicing attorney, you're going to be using what are highly uh, cost. I mean, highly costly legal research methods in order to find cases to be able to cite to help your clients or oppose your clients, uh, you know, in any way. And so uh, your legal research all moved online, but we were Mm -hmm. right there on that borderline where they still wanted you to be able to go figure out how to pull a book off the shelf, but there was almost no use for it at all. So there's this entire bit of knowledge that everybody has spent decades diving into, and the card catalog's a great example, and it just becomes mm-hmm. totally worthless. Here's another example from life, Shannon. Like a hundred years ago, everybody knew how to handle a horse. In order to live yeah. in America, 
you had to know <laughs> how to take care of a horse pretty much no matter who you were 100 years ago, certainly 150 years ago. Now none of us have pretty much any knowledge of horses at all. That entire national uh, obsession with horses. I mean, we have the Kentucky Derby coming up in a couple of weeks, but we basically pay attention to three uh, three Derby races, and that's pretty much it. And none of us really know anything else about horses as a as a country. Yeah, I would be walking for sure. Like I, I like there's there's no way. But I mean, there's a lot of stuff like I. I couldn't, like, I used to mow my own lawn when I was growing up. Like, I couldn't even tell you how to start a lawnmower right now. I mean, I might be able to pull that string, and even if that's still what they do, right? Do they still pull the, the sort of the cord to start I, the I engine of the lawnmower? To, yeah, I used to do my own lawn mowing when I first, I'm now I'm going to mm-hmm. sound like a diva, but I used to, uh, I used to mow my own lawn for, I probably mowed my own lawn until I was about 33 or 34. Oh, and wow. I'm, I, I'm 42 now. So about seven or eight years ago, I was like, yeah, I'm paying somebody to do this from now on. Yeah. But before that, I would get in the backyard. I had my own lawnmower. Yeah, you got to well, – we did. I mean, I don't. we didn't have a riding mower. My yard was not big enough. Mm-mm. But you had the, you know, ripcord uh, lawnmower uh, yeah. thing. And, uh, yeah, I would get out and uh, and I would cut the grass. Now I don't do it. Um, yeah. I don't think that's a diva no. thing. Does your husband – does your husband cut the, cut the grass? No. No, we have somebody that does it. But even, like, growing up in Florida, like, we didn't we, – we had very little money growing up. And so we would have to line dry our clothes. And so, like, we had – we didn't have a, uh, a dryer. I mean, we had yeah. one, but it took, like, 14 hours to dry, like, one load of whatever because it So you would hang the clothes in the backyard? Yeah. And okay. if anyone – I'm sure you have listeners out there who know what towels feel like after they've been hanging in the, the sun for, ni- like, 95-degree weather. They're, they literally could stand up on their own. That's how, like – like stiff they are and so yeah. yeah we used to line dry all of our stuff and of course like we were kids so we'd throw it in the basket and we'd forget about it and then like two days later we'd be like oh shoot we got to go hang this up and then you know they stink and then you're hanging it so it's just a complete mess but yeah it's uh the, the 80s and the 90s were such a great time weren't they <laughs> uh yeah i mean honestly they were an awful lot of fun we're talking to shannon spake yeah. you can go follow her on twitter at shannon spake we are one week from the first round of the nfl draft did you ever did you ever cover the NBA? I know you covered a ton yeah. of college basketball. Did you ever do work at the NBA draft? Yeah, I did. I covered it. I want to say it was 2015, Carl Anthony Towns. I think there was like seven a bunch Kentucky, of Kentucky kids that guys. went in the first 10. And I got to do the interviews uh, when they first walked off the stage. So I was sort of in that position. They, they announce their name. They walk across. You know, they shake the hands, they get the hat, they walk off, and I'm right there waiting for them. And fortunately, I knew all of those guys, right? I knew all of them. Um, Frank Comiskey, I think, was in that draft. Um, uh, what's his name that played at Wisconsin? Who uh, he had like he was like he had Aaron Rodgers like texting him on the phone. Uh, Decker. All of those. Kentucky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sam Decker. All of those kids that um, that that were playing at Kentucky. I mean, Willie that was the Stein year that Kentucky there. was um, like 37 and 0 Devin and Booker. lost in the Final Four mm-hmm. to Wisconsin, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and Cal was there, and so it was. It was literally one of the best nights of of my career because it was so fascinating to see these kids who I've covered so many times, and they, when when they walk on that court, they are completely in a zone. They are completely focused. I bet you they don't even realize who's on the court with them or around them because all they see is ball and net and, and their competitors. And then they walked into this room where they didn't know what was going to happen that night. They didn't know where they were going to go. They didn't know what their future held. You could tell that they were in a totally different space, whether it be excitement, nerves, anxious something I had not seen out of these, these kids at all year, right? Because they are nailed when they're on that court and then they walk off and, and the emotions, just the pure emotions that those guys felt when they, when they sort of got this announcement and, and knew where they were going. So it was, it was pretty incredible night. I love the draft for many reasons. Uh, as a fan, it's because you get the idea that if you squint and look in the right direction, you can kind of divine the future. And so that's exciting from a fan perspective But from a capitalist perspective, I love the minting of all the millionaires. Mm -hmm. All these kids, many of whom did not grow up with a lot of assets, suddenly in the space of one night see their dreams come to full fruition. And to me, that is just a continuation of the American dream over and over and over again, right? Where uh, you hope that your kids, whatever you do for a living, as you are listening out to us out there right now, you hope that your kids are going to have a better life than you did, right? I mean, that's 
the I think the cardinal uh, truth that I would say unites all parents across race, class, ethnicity, yeah. religion, everything. Every single person who has kids wants their kids to have a better future than they yeah. had. And there you are seeing so many of these young guys, particularly the first round picks, who if they make smart decisions, regardless of how their career goes going forward, they have life-changing money for their families and their future children. And that is pretty and, captivating from a news and story perspective. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's the argument, Clay, right? Where could, should they be allowed to go right away? Do, should they have to go to college? Should they have to go through all these things? And, you know, and I, I mean, I was right there front and center for John Calipari, you know, the one and done. He started that. And now a lot of people have obviously uh, taken that philosophy on. But it's like, if these kids are ready to go, you risk injury, you risk all these things. And I'm not saying all kids are ready to go, right? Because there are a lot of players that go to the NBA or go or could go to the NFL. And I think the NFL is a different, uh, a different breed because of the physicality. I do think it takes a, a little bit of um, it's a lot different than high school, right? If you went straight from high school to the NFL, I think it'd be really tough. But there are a lot of NBA players who may be ready uh, right away, especially after one year. And and you have to, I mean, if that's their skill, if that's what they are going to make their money off of, if that's what they're going to do, uh, then then why not let them? But I would, I I would tell my own sons. Of, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but I would tell my own sons, go. If you have yeah. the opportunity to make tens of millions of dollars, you have right. to do it, right? And but I understand there are people 1%. out there. But yeah, I understand. Because there's a lot of that that might go one year and might not make it. And then, yeah. then what happens, right? Then they don't have that the education. So there is the argument on both sides. But I have been front and center for those one year, right? I mean, to, to let them go. I mean, Kobe Bryant, perfect example, right? LeBron James, perfect example. Like, these guys were ready, and they went, and they, they capitalized on that. But yeah, it, it's a, it's, I think it's a valid argument. I think you can listen to both sides, because there are examples for both that make sense. Uh, but I was right there for those one and done, and I think that those kids were ready. The perspective that I have on it is, we let kids who are 18 years old get guns and go right. get shot at overseas. Uh, and th- their reward for that is a pin drop compared to what okay. we reward top athletes. So if you're allowing 18-year-olds to risk their lives to serve the country, as we are, the the risk-reward to me of an 18-year-old, if you don't pan out as an athlete, that stinks. But there's no guarantee that you would have panned out as an athlete at 20 or 21 or 22 Take the money when you have the opportunity to get the money as an athlete. Change your life forever. Sort of live what I would say is the sports fairy tale. We were we started off this conversation talking about drama for mm-hmm. men and a lot of women too. Sports is sports is a male soap opera for a lot of men out. Back in the day when women used to watch soap operas all the time, men would make fun of the soap opera. But really, sports is a soap opera, right? Um, it mm-hmm. is a dramatic uh, pursuit of championship, of wins, of losses, of everything else. And the fairy tale aspect, I would say, of sports is that any given kid out there could grow up to do this for a living, which is what most men and a lot of women as well dream about when they start playing sports in the first place is, hey, somewhere down the line, I'm going to be able to make a living doing this. And to me, on draft night, one week from today in the NFL, we will have that moment crystallized for 32 different players. Yeah, and you think about all of the things that these players put their bodies through, and and, and yes, they're having a great time and, and, and gaining all these amazing experiences, but they do risk injury every single time they go out there onto that football field, and they've now made it to the point where they know that they're going to be providing for their families, and there, you know, there are, there are a lot of instances where there, I mean, there, I mean, a lot where there are, there, this is life-changing. This is generational changing for their entire families, and that's, you know, even when I, when I talk to, to athletes who sign huge contracts, and you're just like, wow, you, this is a generational thing, right? This is now changing things for generations and generations to come, which I think, agree with you 100%, is the most fascinating part of this night. These guys are not only living out their dreams, but they're changing their lives for their entire families. Can you come back with us for like five minutes sure. to close out this hour? Yeah, uh, I want to talk Halladega, to you. Man. Yeah, well, we've got to talk to Halladega, and also we were talking <laughs> off the air about the uh, the way that it felt a little bit like the O.J. Simpson trial, and you got yeah. me thinking when we were off the air the Derek Chauvin, George Floyd case, 
it did feel, whatever it was, 25 years later, 28 years later, however long it's been since the O.J. Simpson trial, I think that was 94 or 95, I'm not sure that there has been a trial that has received as much attention for the trial verdict since then. I want to kind of go back in time and talk about that as well as the fact that Talladega is coming up. 